Before I introduce our next storyteller, who is a professor, I think it's worth letting everyone know that immigrants are our educators, our engineers, our scientists, our innovators. And this next storyteller is just that. And he hails from Nigeria. Give it up for Sheun Joshua. So my story is, um, a long time ago, I left West Africa, a city in West Africa. This city is known as Ibadan. And uh, I left that city to come to America. What I remember most about that city was the fact that it was surrounded by high hills. <clears throat> there was a lot, of, a lot of dust, a lot of sun, a lot of palm trees. Just a lot of activity going on, right? But the thing, that still, the thing that stands out about that city is it was a place of light and warmth. I left this city in the late 1980s and moved to the city of New York. I came not really as an immigrant, but more as an emigrant. There's a, there's a difference between the two. All right? <laughs> and I came to be with my parents, who were university students at the time, and who were kind of coming to terms with settling in the United States. Right? Now, I came as a five-year-old. When I got to the city, when I got to America, you know, like any normal kid, you kind of take it all in, you know, trying to, try to understand the place. And uh, one of the first things I, I remember about New York was that it was, you know, it was a place that was cold and dark. <laughs> the very opposite of the light and warmth that I knew West Africa to be. So trying to fit in during those early years was kind of tough, you know, it wasn't easy. I didn't know, I just moved to New York during the crack epidemic, you know, we all know about that, right? Yeah. It was a little wild. It was a little wild back then. <laughs> and uh, you know, the place was filled with a lot with men and women who were kind of you know had erratic behaviors. And uh, you know, one time, you know, even as a kid, I think I was like maybe like six years old. I remember this vividly. You know, I saw some some man walking the streets, kind of had powder on his lips. And something tells me today they get the powder on his lips from eating donuts. You know, so. <laughs> All right, but this was a this was a lot to take in as a kid. You know, as a five year old kid. And, and you know, in a new country, dealing with a new culture, right? It also did help that I was thrown into schools with some of the kids who, you know, had that they were the kids of the, uh, the their parents of the people that I was just describing to you, right? So now you are in the school with a bunch of kids whose parents are kinda of out of control, so you already know parents are out of control, kids are out of control, right? Now <clears throat> you know there's there's bound to be some conflict between the, uh, the values that were instilled in me by my African elders and the uh, values of this you know, quote unquote new world, right? As time went on, growing up in the African American community, I developed a bit of a, a bit of a, an issue. Now, I, I began to ask myself, you know, am I African or am I African American? <clears throat> now, I struggle to reconcile these two halves, right? The first album I ever bought, that's why that, the music that I was playing, the first album I ever bought was Onyx. Me too. <laughs> that's the first album I ever bought. And, uh, you know, hip hop was a major part of my life. And then and now still. However, the opposite side of, the, of that is I grew up in a house that, you know, Bob Marley, Fela Kuti, Sunday Day, Day, these were, this was the music that was ruling the sound waves in my house. Anytime I tried to play Onyx or Nas, you know, I had a father that would be like, what is this garbage? <laughs> 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 But, you know, I guess the old man just got really get jiggy with all that kind of 
coming. <laughs> so my parents, right, they were always remind me. You are different from them. <laughs> but when, you, when I went to school, you had kids in school that'd be telling you, hey, yo, son, go back to Africa. <laughs> so, <clears throat> funny thing is, I felt like them. I sounded like them. I looked like them. I fell in love with the girls who were them. <laughs> but the them didn't really see me as them. It's got, a, it's got a weird situation, right? Just, the whole thing felt weird, really. The indoctrination at home, the indoctrination outside. It, it wasn't until I became an adult that I realized that it was me media misinformation and a lot of Eurocentric ideologies and propaganda over centuries that was responsible for the issues that the I and the them were having. Anyway, so one day, I walk into my seventh grade English class, right? Not knowing it's gonna be the beginning of a pivotal time in my life. The teacher was out, we had a sub, and everybody knows what's up. When we have a substitute, class is jumping. Pop and pop, right? <laughs> anyway, so I walk into the class, and it happens that the teacher is actually the substitute is actually a woman who just moved to America from Nigeria. So she's doing a roll call. And she gets to my name. And she gets excited. Hey, Africa. Yeah, yeah, I forgot. I was like, damn. <laughs> you know, you're, trying, you're trying to lay low, you know. <laughs> you don't want unnecessary attention. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so there was this kid in the class named Kevin, right? And, I'm sorry, and the woman, actually before Kevin did what he did, right? The woman now did something that nobody, people had pretty much stopped doing by that time. She actually pronounced my name correctly. <laughs> you see, my name is spelled S-E-U-N, right? And everybody automatically thinks it's Sean, but it's actually pronounced Sheon, right? Now the first time Kevin heard that, Kevin, you know, he, goes, he, he starts laughing at it. <coughs> Let's be real, I'm not, you know, nobody else. I'm like, Kevin, what you laughing at, man? Right. Now, Kevin, funny enough, Kevin should have been a junior in high school by this time. <laughs> Kevin should have been a junior in high school by this time when he was in the eighth grade in my seventh grade English class. So, right, so let's just say, you know, back, back, back then, you know, this whole no child left behind thing. You know, so, you know, a bunch of kids were getting left all the way by, right? Yeah, so Kevin was one of them. Anyway. Anyway. So anyway, Kevin says what he says. You know, I, I, I shoot back, you know, with my swap mouth. You know, we you know, we start rumbling. All I remember, I remember, I'm like seventh grade, you know, five, four, still looking like this, you know. And Kevin is probably about the size I am now, right? <laughs> You already know where this is going. <laughs> All I remember was getting picked up and body slammed through some desks. Man, the African woman, <laughs> that I don't think was going to help me out, she runs out of the classroom and she's screaming, Oh my God, they're going to kill each other! Administrators run in, and you know they always late. All the administrators, they always late. They run in after I got slammed through the desk. They separate us. Next day, find myself in school suspension. They still suspended people back then. I don't know about now, but that's another story. Um, so, <laughs> find myself in school suspension with a lot of work to do and a new book to read. The book was the autobiography of Malcolm X. So, you see, Black History Month, right, had always been a part of school experiences. But I didn't, I, I didn't really pay much attention to the depth of the content being forced down our throats every second month of the year, right? I mean, I knew Martin had a dream. 
I knew Harriet was bossing on the Underground Railroad. <laughs> but it still didn't make much sense to me as a kid whose parents had no real connection to that, to those events. You see, my heroes at the time, based on my upbringing, had the names of Awoloa, Nkrumah, Lumumba, Azikiwe, and Mandela. Reading about Malcolm's early life filled me with challenges I could never filled with challenges I could never imagine. His journeys to Africa, his desire to reconnect with his African roots, and reconnect Africans who were born in America to their roots, awakened to me an understanding I really never had before. It was the first time I understood that I, as an African and an African American, were really two sides of the same coin. After that book and many others, which highlighted to me centuries of the African struggle in the New World, a new set of names were added to my pantheon of heroes. In addition to the chiefs and the rulers of these ancient Yoruba kingdoms, right? My ancestors began to bear the names Tubman, Douglas, Wells, Bethune, King, and the shining prince himself, Malcolm Chabaz. You see, <clears throat> One of my favorite songs is Africa Was Cut Up by Nas and Damien Wong. Okay, all right. So like, yeah, I know that song. All right, in that song, right, Nas talks about Sudanic soldiers carried to battlefronts far from their lands of origin. It occurred to me after reading a lot of these books that maybe I too was just a Sudanic soldier, part of whose mission and existence serves to represent and connect two sections of a disconnected hope. Thank you.